I'm David Feldman, and this is The Mop Up. Well, this is turning out to be my favorite time of the year, but only because it'll soon be over. I hated 2022. This was the year my mother died. But even still, I hated it. Inflation, (laughs) she would have laughed at that. Inflation, COVID, Ukraine, wildfires, and hurricanes. It's incredible what Kanye West can blame on the Jews. Well, at least Joe Biden had a good 2022. Must be his lucky year. I'm told he also had a lucky 2022 B.C. Did I mention Joe Biden is old? He's very, very old. I had high hopes for 2022. This was the year I thought I'd sell a sitcom. Instead, I had to sell my television. I promised I would eat better, but I still chew with my mouth open and use my cat as a napkin. So much disappointment in 2022. Like most of you, it feels right now like I'm limping to the finish line and Rosie Ruiz just jumped out of the bushes to cut in front of me. Don't worry, Rosie Ruiz doesn't even get that reference. I can't help but think right now of all the friends I lost this year. But when you forget to call me on my birthday, you're dead to me. I thought 2022 would be the year I'd quit vaping. It wasn't. But at least this year, I only use my mouth. I did did accomplish accomplish some of my goals. This year, I walked 10,000 steps every morning trying to find my pedometer. By the way, pedometer counts how far you've walked, whereas pedometer counts how many priests are in a three-mile radius. I've also kept a promise to myself and my shrink by cutting down on pornography. Now, I only work with directors I know. And I'm spending way more time in the kitchen cooking, which is saving me a fortune on meth. But even still, 2022 was a huge disappointment. Then again, you never really know how bad a year it was until enough time has passed. For example, in a speech celebrating her 40th year on the throne, Queen Elizabeth said, quote, 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. She then famously referred to 1992 as her Annus Horribilis. And I'm sure back in 1992, Queen Elizabeth meant that. But I wonder what she thinks of 2022. Something tells me Queen Elizabeth would most assuredly look back at 1992 with undiluted pleasure compared to how 2022 is turning out for her. Here's a general rule of thumb when it comes to keeping score. Any year that lasts longer than you do is a bad year. Also, who told Queen Elizabeth Annus Horribilis were the proper words for an after-dinner speech when people are still digesting their venison? Annus Horribilis is what my epidemiologist screams whenever I return from a carnival cruise and need more deworming medication. Well, anyway, this is the part of my holiday message where I urge you to donate to my favorite charities so I don't have to. If you have some extra cash, Bernie Sanders has some extra ideas on where to spend it. I'll put a link in the description if you're interested. You can click on it and take a look at all the worthy charities that Bernie Sanders thinks you should give to. And Bernie Sanders is never wrong. Finally, I just want to say during this holiday season, if I may, that no matter what faith you believe in, stop. You're completely wrong. Seriously, stop. Stop with the religion. 
you're destroying America. Join me for office hours. We do office hours at 8 p.m. every Friday night. I'm there for the first hour, first 90 minutes. I make myself available to all the listeners. All you need is Zoom, and I've put the link in the description. So please join us. Meet better people. Come to office hours. We have a growing community of miscreants who I think you'll really enjoy. Don't spend the holiday season alone. Come join us at office hours tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern. As I said, the Zoom link is in the description or go to my website and just hit office hours. It'll take you right in. And while you're over there at my website, please sign up for my newsletter. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Donald Trump's tax returns are finally out. Under dependence, he put Adderall. He's addicted to Adderall. Whenever Donald Trump is asked why he pays so little in taxes, he always says, because I'm stupid. No, the answer is the rest of us are. I I screwed that up. (laughs) Let me say that again. That's not a good way to start. Uh, Whenever Donald Trump is asked why he pays so little in taxes, he always says, because I'm smart. Uh, No, the correct answer is the rest of us are stupid, especially David Feldman, who is going to go over (laughs) Donald Trump's taxes. Boy, did I screw that one up. I'm David Feldman, and this is... The mop up, I hope. Donald Trump paid zero taxes in 2020 and zero taxes in 2017. Zero. That's the latest information to come out of the House Ways and Means Committee, which voted to release the former president's tax returns going back six years. Here's what we now know about the former president's tax returns. Between the years 2015 and 2020, Donald Trump lost money four out of those six years. And of the two years where he did make money and where he did pay taxes on that income, we now know that he only paid an effective tax rate of 4.5%. How is that possibly legal? Even worse, the Internal Revenue Service failed to conduct a mandatory audit of Trump during the first two years of his presidency, even though the IRS is required by law to perform that audit. The IRS did not begin to audit President Trump until Democrats gained control of the House in 2019. In 2019, they asked to see his tax returns. It was Richie Neal, the Democratic chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, who wanted to see his tax returns two years into Trump's presidency. So on April 3rd, 2019, Richie Neal, chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, wrote a letter to the Internal Revenue Service demanding Trump's tax returns, which is well within the purview of the House Ways and Means Committee. We now know that on April 3rd, 2019, when Richie Neal, chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, wrote that letter, we now know that on that day, Trump's mandatory audits kicked in. And because an audit can take several years, we still don't know the results of those audits. In other words, had the Democrats not taken control of the House in 2019, Donald Trump never would have been audited by the Internal Revenue Service. Why? What was going on? Who was making the calls to the IRS? Even worse, Trump maintains he could never release his tax returns because he was being audited. Well, we now know that he wasn't being audited, not to mention that there is no law preventing a president from releasing his tax returns while there's an audit. There's no law. He could release his tax returns any time he wanted to. Why was Donald Trump not audited by the Internal Revenue Service while he was president? Who stopped it? 
The returns are now public, sort of. They're sort of public, but uh, they're public, but there's no way to tell if his tax returns are truthful because that requires an audit, right? And yes, the last two years of his presidency are right now being audited, but that's going to take years to complete because the IRS is outgunned. I'll talk about that in a second. OK, what we have right now is Donald Trump once again can run for president lying about his net worth, lying about what he owes our government and lying about whoever Oh, whoever he owes money to. OK, he can he can continue to lie because the IRS didn't do its job and really can't do its job. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. What we know now is what we always suspected, and that is Donald Trump relied on very sophisticated accounting tricks to conceal money from the government, to conceal money from uh, creditors. Uh, we also know that Donald Trump really doesn't earn money. He owes more than he earns. And we don't know who exactly he owes that money to. How do Trump's finances work? Well, we think it goes something like this. Trump lost $105 million in 2015 which is why he ran for president. You know, there's money to be made in raising money and then not spending it on your campaign. More about that in a few minutes. OK, so he lost one hundred and five million dollars in 2015. He was out of options, right, uh, because he had lost seven hundred million dollars that we know of in 2009. Now, he declares those losses. This is what we're able to see from the tax returns. He declares those losses on his taxes, and he is able to carry those losses into future years, into future tax returns. He can spread out the losses over several years so that when he has a good year, and by the way, his good years are not that great, but when he has a good year, the profits are offset by the losses from the previous years, and that limits his tax liability. But because there is no complete audit, we have many unanswered questions. How does he finance his lifestyle with so much debt? How did he keep his real estate companies afloat, even though they continue to lose money? Who lent him money? Who did he pay back? Who didn't he have to pay back? What were the terms of the loan? Who exactly was he indebted to while he was president of the United States? These are reasonable questions. We know that his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and the Kushner family of grifters, we now know that they were about to default on a $1.2 billion loan for 666 Fifth Avenue back in 2019. Yes, the satanic Kushner family owed $1.2 billion on 666 Fifth Avenue. The timing of how they repaid that loan isn't just suspicious, it's criminal. Somehow, while Jared Kushner was in the White House advising Donald Trump on foreign policy, a loan for the indebted Kushner family, a loan came through linked to the country of Qatar. I'm sure you've read about this. Now, at the time that this was going on, Kushner was overseeing Donald Trump's White House Middle East policy. Qatar is in the Middle East. OK, 2017, Trump's first year in office, Kushner instructs Trump to side against Qatar to side with Saudi Arabia in accusing Qatar of aiding and abetting terrorists. So Trump, on the advice of Kushner, supported an economic blockade against Qatar. That was 2017. But then in 2018, Kushner, Kushner invited representatives from Qatar to the White House, and Trump suddenly reversed course 
and came out against the economic blockade of Qatar. Again, that was 2018, the same year Qatar bailed out the Kushner family to the tune of, we think, $1.2 billion. So in 2017, Kushner had Trump convinced that Qatar was a nation that financed terrorism. A year later, it no longer financed terrorism, according to Jared Kushner. Why? Because a year later, Qatar financed Jared Kushner. Again, 2018 was the same year Qatar bailed out the Kushner family. And while all this is going on, 2017, 2018, the IRS is not performing its due diligence and auditing the president of the United States. As Timothy O'Brien writes today in Bloomberg, we know that Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin and Jared Kushner both left the Trump White House pocketing massive deals with Middle Eastern investors, billions of dollars. What deals did Trump have in place when he left? Will he show us his tax returns for 2021? Will he show us his returns for the two years he's been out of office? Who feathered Donald Trump's nest when he left the White House for Mar-a-Lago? Now, right now, I said I would talk about this. Right now, he's raising hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to run for re-election. Some of that money is going to his legal fees. Some to the legal fees of people who work for him and have been forced to testify before all those grand juries. And it's perfectly legal for Donald Trump to pay the legal fees for all the employees who he wants to take the fifth. So... How much is in his war chest? And when he drops out of the race, does he keep all the money that people donated? Does he keep the war chest? Of course he does. That's why he ran for president in 2015. Do you remember I told you he lost $100 million in 2015? He was desperate. He needed a gimmick. He needed a way to make money. So he ran for office. He just did. It's like the producers, the movie, the producers. He just didn't think he was going to win. We've seen the tax returns of all our presidents and all our candidates since 1977, but not Donald Trump's. And despite the document dump today, we still haven't seen his tax returns because without the IRS enforcing his tax returns without audits, without human resources to conduct these mandatory audits, Trump and his spinners can continue to claim whatever they want. Again, the last two years of uh, Donald Trump's presidency are being audited as we speak, but it will take years to complete those audits because our IRS is outgunned. Now, one of the other takeaways from this document dump is that Donald Trump's real estate portfolio loses money consistently over the years. That is going to be embarrassing to uh, him because his idiot followers think he's a whiz at making money, making wise real estate decisions. No, he's a failure at real estate. His real estate portfolio loses money. When he does have a good year, and it's rare, the bulk of that income comes from outside investments, passive money like dividends on stock or interest on money that's just sitting there. He is a dolt. He is he is not a real estate tycoon. He's not a real estate genius. He loses money on all his real estate And when he's lucky, when he has a good year, he can offset the losses on his real estate through passive income like interest and dividends. He is a failure. He is a failure. He inherited about a quarter of a billion dollars from his old man and lost all of it. Now, the IRS is outgunned. This is a serious problem. According to a new report, Trump's tax returns 
are incredibly complicated, purposely so. And instead of bringing in highly experienced investigators to sift through his complexities, dodges and lies, the Internal Revenue Service at first decided to just sit on their hands and allow the returns to lay dormant because they didn't know where to start. The Washington Post today reports that an in-house IRS memo during the Trump presidency said that Trump's taxes were so complicated that, quote, it is not possible to obtain the resources available to examine all potential issues. Trump's tax returns, for example, in 2015, had more than 400 shell corporations. He was running his income through 400 different corporations. Our IRS was outgunned. That same year, 2015, the year that he lost $100 million and had to run for president, the Post reports that Trump took a $21 million deduction on his taxes for donating 158 acres of land. But there was no appraisal. He just decided the land was worth uh, $21 million. He just decided that. The Post says he reported making 500000 in cash donations for 2018 and 2019, but provides no receipts. And we already know that he's forbidden from running any charities in the state of New York. Donald Trump knew that the IRS didn't have the agents, the resources, or the money to audit him properly. These people... These people like Jared Kushner, they think they're above the law and that they don't have to pay a price for anything, including their income, their taxes. Kushner's father went to prison in 2005, partly because of federal tax ev evasion. Now, why is it important to see any president's tax returns, not just Donald Trump's? Why is it important to see any presidential candidate's tax returns? Because, believe it or not, the president of the United States is not allowed to get rich on the job. He's also not allowed to do things while president that will make him rich when he stops being president. There is an emoluments clause which forbids our president, it's in the Constitution, forbids our president from accepting gifts and money from foreign dignitaries. We know Trump trampled the emoluments clause by owning that hotel in Washington, D.C. while he was president. It is unconscionable that the IRS did not audit the president of the United States. The House Ways and Means Committee, Richie Neal is the outgoing chairman, has introduced legislation today that would update the 1977 law which mandates that the IRS audit every president. This new law, which Nancy Pelosi has promised to fast track in the waning days of her speakership, this new law would require the IRS to begin auditing a president's tax returns no later than 90 days after he files them. The Republicans are opposed to this. The ranking Republican member of the committee of the House Ways and Means Committee, I think his name is Doggett. Uh, yesterday, he said it is a sad day for America that House Ways and Means Committee is releasing the president's tax returns. He warned of the proverbial slippery slope. He warned that if the House Ways and Means Committee can make public the tax returns of a sitting president, or a former president, what's to prevent this committee from making public the tax returns of our Supreme Court justices? Yeah, that would be horrible. The Supreme Court justices having to release their tax returns. Be still my heart. That would be a tragedy. God forbid we ever find out how much money Ginny Thomas took in from the Stop the Steal movement. Look, it is no secret it is no secret that our IRS is severely underfunded, something that has been remedied by President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, which passed earlier this year. 
$80 billion in additional funding has been earmarked for the IRS to permit the agency over the next 10 years to fill 87,000 additional jobs that the IRS needs to keep track of our growing population. We've been cutting funding for the IRS since Reagan took office. The, our population is growing, but the staff at the IRS is shrinking. 87,000 new IRS agents is the number our Treasury Department says the Internal Revenue Service would need to do a halfway decent job. But there's no indication yet of just how many new IRS agents will be hired out of that $80 billion. Uh, but you can be sure over the next five or 10 years, they're going to add about, you know, 50,000 new IRS agents uh, just to figure out Donald Trump's taxes. They're just going to need 50,000 agents on the job pouring over Donald Trump's taxes. They are going to spend money. They are going to spend money on the IRS. However, Democrats lost the House and elections have consequences. Republicans will gain control of the House on January 3rd. And they have promised, they have promised that one of their first acts will be to pass legislation cutting funding for the IRS. Now, the fiscal hawks, you'll find them uh, in, in the Democratic Party. These are the blue dogs. But every single Republican, every single one claims to be a fiscal hawk. And they claim to, to say we can't keep running up these debts, this deficit. So whenever there's a bill to help us, the Republicans ask, how do we pay for it? And the answer is the Republicans don't want to pay for it. They have purposely underfunded the IRS because that's what Republicans have been sent to Washington, D.C. to do. They are sent to Washington, D.C. to cut taxes and make it impossible to collect the taxes they haven't cut. So when Republicans say we can't afford it, what they really mean is we don't want to pay for it. They only want to pay for government projects that line the pockets of their corporate donors. Why do we allow this? Why? As I said at the top of this segment, and I blew it, so I'll repeat it. At the, uh, in 2016, when asked why he paid so little in taxes, Donald Trump said, because I'm smart. What he should have said is the American people are stupid. We are stupid for allowing this. I'm David Feldman. Do me a favor, hit the like and subscribe button. Please stay strong and protect the weak. Have you been injured in an accident? Call the law firm of Feldman and Hirsch. <laughs> Let me let me start. Hang on. All right, hang on. <laughs> no, Feldman, Hershenfeld, and Hershenfeld. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's right. That does sound better. Yeah. <laughs> Have you been taken advantage of <laughs> by anybody in any form <laughs> at any time? Would you like to be taken advantage of? <laughs> so, what is the name of our law firm? Feldman, Hershenfeld, and Feldman. I mean, Hershenfeld, Feldman, and Hershenfeld. That's the the Feldman should be in the middle. <laughs> All right. Welcome. It's time now for the Hershenfelds. And Dr. Philip Hershenfeld is a Freudian psychoanalyst. He's the real deal. We joke around on this show, but you are a real psychiatrist. You're, you're not somebody who listens for five seconds, whips out the pad and pencil or pen and gives a prescription. You are, you do the talking here. I do the talking. You do the, and you listen. I do listen. Right. Every it's the, the most fascinating job in the world for me, not for somebody else. Right. I'm a peeping I'm, Tom. I, I, I'm a, I like, uh, you know, uh, listening yeah. in on 
Uh, but uh, and also joining us is Dr. Samuel Benjamin's alter ego, <laughs> Ethan Hirschenfeld, author of Today Is Now. Go buy this book right now. I don't ask my listeners for much. Go, go right now and purchase uh, this. Uh, thank you for recording, Dan. Somebody hit the record button. Thank you for that. I, I should hit. Hang on for one second. It's not easy. Hang on. Okay. I. I let me hang on for one second. All right. We're, we're recording. Good. All okay. Right. Go buy. Go buy. Today is now. Yeah. It's a hysterical book. It has the Feldman guarantee. And you don't have to buy it today. You can buy it tomorrow. Buy it now. Oh, buy it now. Yeah. Today is now. Buy it now. On and um, as you were saying that Dr. Philip Hershenfeld is the real deal. Uh, Dr. Samuel Benjamin is whatever the opposite is of the real deal. He's uh, right. but he means well. And there's a lot of wisdom in those in those pages. He absolutely means well. I can attest to that. So is traveling to see family for Christmas worth it? Right now, the National Weather Service says we're about to experience a once in a generation blizzard in the Northeast. The snow, they're calling it the snowpocalypse, right? 9,000 flights have been canceled, delayed in the Midwest alone. Every single state in the United States is affected by this. Temperatures are plummeting. We have 50 mile per hour winds, whiteout conditions. Traveling to see relatives right now is not the smartest idea in the world. You're going to end up waiting at the airport. You'll spend days on the tarmac if you're lucky enough to board the plane. People are traveling by car, by bus, by train. Everybody wants to see their families, even if it literally kills them. Is it worth it? I uh, um, let me let me go first. Let me yeah. go first. Yes. Yes. It's worth it because, you know, let's be honest, your life's not going that great anyway. So <laughs> if you die on the way home to Akron or whatever <laughs> shitty place you live in, you know, you, you tried it in the big city. It was going OK. It wasn't going great. Let's be honest. Uh, it was going well enough that when you went home, you could kind of impress the locals, but it wasn't going great. So, you know. It's worth trying to get home to do a little bragging and Im impress the locals and, and make your parents proud. But in person, it's worth it, even if you die. And you probably will. <laughs> it's worth it. And yeah. if you make it there safely, you get COVID. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or you bring COVID to your elderly relatives. You bring big city COVID to small town family. That's they, they have. The, the, the COVID in those small towns is lazy COVID. It's slow talking COVID. It sits on the back porch and whittles. But yeah. big city COVID is the real deal. We don't uh, know anything about your fancy hacking and Flemish yeah. often. Yeah. And also no, apologies to Akron and LeBron James. Now, Dr. Dr. Hershenfeld, please. Quay Bono. That was Sonny Bono's uh, <laughs> first wife before Cher, uh, who did not benefit too well from that marriage, I might add. Who benefits? Who benefits? That's the main question when a crime is committed that the detective asks. Who benefited from this, this crime? Right. So I would say David Feldman, is sort of committing a crime by trying to convince everybody that it's beyond dangerous to go home. And therefore, I, I would ask, in what way are you benefiting, David, from scaring the shit out of all these poor people? Because I am a foot soldier in the war on Christmas and we're losing every year. Yeah. I wage war on the holidays, okay. Hanukkah, Christmas, anything, any celebration. I'm okay. against it. OK, you know, it's really not fair that um, Christmas now gets the CH. Hanukkah used to have the CH. 
And then we got demoted to the H. Why did we get stuck with the H? The, the Hanukkah thing was just fine. In the 60s, it was Hanukkah. 70s, it was Hanukkah. 80s, it was It was always Hanukkah. The CH, talk about a war. That's a, that's, that was anti-Semitic. They yes. took the C away. They kept it for themselves. They, um, they, yeah, it's they don't call it Christmas. They don't. No. They, so oh. they took the C and they yeah. don't even use it. No, they took the C and they don't use it. Yeah, which is it's just like a Gentile. <laughs> Take take from us and then don't use it. Anyway, no. But um, and and Juanza, back a uh, happy Juanza to everyone. Yeah. So I should mention, if you're going to be in New York City, Christmas Eve, which would be yes. Saturday night. Yes. Go to the comic strip in New York City to see the funniest man on the planet, Ethan Hershenfeld. Wow. Or wow. Mary Stickmas. Mary Stickmas, 7 and 9.30 p.m. shows. There's a 7 p.m. show and a 9.30 p.m. show. Tickets on Eventbrite, promo code Ethan for a very big discount. I promise you, you will laugh. You will laugh. If you're spending Christmas alone, <laughs> which I think you should, but that's a whole lot. <laughs> but I'll get to that in a second. Go to the comic strip in New York City, Christmas Eve, Chinese food, right? Chinese food, Jewish jokes. What more could you ask for? And you get to spend uh, a couple hours in one of the remaining historic temples of comedy in New York City. Caroline's is gone. Danger Fields is gone. The comic strip lives on. Yeah. So uh, come come to the comic strip Saturday night, Christmas Eve. Merry Shtickmas. Support live comedy, even if it kills you. That's, that's my the, that's the Yes. Yes. You will laugh and you will die. Yes. So, Dr. Hershenfeld. What? <laughs> you, you pestering me again? <laughs> You're a real nudge. Okay. The, the, fifth, the fifth vaccine. Most Americans are not getting the fifth vaccine. You got it. Just between there's nobody listening to this. Oh, you got, you, he, got the, he also got the sixth. I'm about to get the six. What is the sixth one? I'm just doing the the fifth one over again, because I have heard from certain sources that if you're of a certain age, um, this has really become an epidemic of people over 65. That's who's being hospitalized and that's who's dying. And believe it or not, I fall into that age category. So I've heard a number of, you know, smart people who say that if you're older and if you've had this fifth vaccine for three or four months, the protection is really waning fast, probably. So I'm go back for seconds. Go back for seconds on the fifth. Go back for seconds. Yes, I am. And is it the same cocktail or do they? Oh, tweet? Same thing. Same thing. Right. And probably my arm will hurt a little more than last time. But but I'm a big boy. I, I'm not going to cry about that. And then if you do cry, there's nothing wrong with crying. Just remember that crying is fine. Crying, is, yeah, crying is totally fine. There's no no points for bravery. Don't be a hero. I've been yeah. living, I've been living the other way my entire life. Many of us have. Oh, Temple okay. Grandin. I want to ask you about Temple Grandin. Did you say Temple Emmanuel? I used to belong to Temple Emmanuel, but then I joined Temple Grandin. Okay, because, uh, she is good at leading lamb. To the slaughter. That's her claim to fame. Temple Grandin. Isn't yeah. that correct? That, that she is an animal behavior. She found a way to hug animals so they are less anxious when they're about to get it in the neck. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that heroic? Why do we celebrate her? Her the trickery, the deception. She she pretends to be a, a, a cow's best friend, 
but it's the kiss of death. It, it's what uh, Michael Corleone gave to Fredo in, in Cuba. Why I think do we- that she, I think that this is definitely playing devil's advocate because I don't agree with this. I don't think we should be killing animals at all, but I think one could argue that they're going to be killed anyway. Therefore let's do it in a way that doesn't also panic them. So the murder is one thing, but you don't have to make them anxious and murder them. So uh, I think that that's, that's probably the rationalization, but I don't go in for any of those rationalizations whenever anyone says, yeah, but what about free range chickens? To me, that's just like, okay, they can take a nice stroll and then you kill them. That's not, that's not much better. Uh, it shouldn't. Yeah. Oh, the killing is the problem. Everything else fails. In, all the other stuff fails in comparison. I bring up Temple Grandin because it is the holiday season and millions of Americans are like lambs to the slaughter. They're they're marching in these lines at the airport. And I wonder if Temple Grandin also works for the airlines because I'm amazed at the complacency of airline travelers. We always hear about these people on a plane who act up. I'm amazed that everybody doesn't act up on a plane and freak out. Do you think there is a you're a psychiatrist, doctor? Yes. Yes. No? I am. No, I'm talking to the real psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think somebody like Temple Grandin has helped design the airports to turn us into sheep who don't panic, who just take whatever is foisted upon the one indignity after another? And yet nobody snaps. Why is that? So here's what I would say. I'm beginning to suspect you've got an airline phobia, flying phobia. For one thing, because you're, you know, so hot to trot against this. I also think maybe you shorted all your stocks <laughs> in the airline industry okay. right before Christmas, and you're hoping that they all go down and you're going to make a bundle despite your so called socialist tendencies. I have a Go ahead. A different explanation. I'm sorry, David. Go ahead, and then no, I'll. You go ahead. You go ahead. No, I was. Um, I think the reason people are so calm, in spite of all the indignities, in general, in the airports, it, it's just it's a testimony to just how uncomfortable people are where they are. People are willing to go through anything to get somewhere else. That's the epidemic. It's an epidemic of discomfort and dissatisfaction. And And so it it is airports offer hope. And if people have hope, they're they're calm An airport. There's a there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's there's a there's a trip awaiting you. Just wait patiently. That is that why people don't freak out and get violent at the airport? Listen, it's safer than driving. It's a very safe form of, uh, of transportation. A number of years ago, they, if I get this right, it's, I got it sort of right. I'm not absolutely certain of this. But they made people buy seats for their little children on taking, um, I I think in the Midwest, taking, you know, two, three, four hundred mile plane rides. So many people couldn't afford it. So they drove. Now, this was done supposedly to enhance safety, the little children. Many people drove instead, and the death rate of these people was way up from if they had flown, because plane crashes are pretty damn rare. Right. We're talk- I think we're talking about all of the... Uh, the indignities. Contagions. The indignities and then all the contagion in the airports. Right. So not, the are- ultimate, not the ultimate indignity of death. All the indignities leading up to death. 
Yeah. Well, what about the people who actually enjoy seeing their families? Does anybody really want to see their family? Seriously, does what percentage? Both of you, the real doctor and the fake doctor, ballpark this. How many people really want to see their family? What percentage of Americans are depressed because they're alone? And what percentage are depressed because they're not alone and they have to go spend the holidays with people they don't want to spend it with? What do you think the percentage is? I think it's 27 percent. (laughs) <laughs> uh, who don't want to see their family. And this is related. I just heard the the, the number 27% was uh, there's a, uh, a podcast series um, about estrangement within families that just came out. And I heard the statistic today. It was on WNYC. The statistic was that of those people polled 27% report some estrangement that they've experienced, which means they didn't they didn't then take the next logical step, which is if 27 percent of people have some member of their family from whom they are estranged, that means 100 percent of families have some estrangement in them. Yes, it's more than one out of four. So every family uh, has has this going on in one of the many configurations in the family. And so. Yeah, I, I guess it's probably one out of four people who would prefer not to go visit family. What is? Well, go ahead. Yeah, they might, in a general sense, prefer not to. But then, why do so many of them do it anyway? The free, the free food. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and laundry, also laundry. A lot of people in the big cities, they don't have a laundry unit in their in their apartment. So that's that's exciting. Yeah, they, they may be telling themselves it's for the free food and laundry. Just because they can't acknowledge that along with the antipathy. Yeah, there is connection. There is and there's connection. Yeah. All, David, I've tried to tell you this before. This somehow doesn't penetrate (laughs) all human relationships are ambivalent. Love and hate. Now, the mixture of one or the other is, you know, different in each relationship. But that's just how it is. I love how you say that as though you came up with that and your school came up with what is really just an obvious fact about humans. I mean, of course, everything's ambivalent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's one other big reason that people do go home for the holidays, apart from the free meals and the laundry. A lot of people, a lot of people have a crush on their neighbor, their childhood neighbor. There's right. a lot of that over the fence, across the street, over on the corner. There's a crush. There's some unrequited, unresolved thing from their teenage years or even earlier. So they, they might not even know it, but they're going home hoping that they might finally get to screw their neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful sentiment. I'm, I'm surprised that the Hallmark Channel has made a movie based on that theory. That, that's so beautiful. Did you guys, you youngsters, ever hear of the book A Stone for Danny Fisher? No. no. I've heard of A Fish for Danny Stone. No, that's somebody okay. else. Okay. This is one of the uh, early sexy, you know, like Harold Robbins type thing. Maybe even Harold Robbins wrote it. I have no idea who wrote it. And Jerome Robbins choreographed it. (laughs) So Danny Fisher was this Jewish kid growing up in some suburban Long Island town. Who The stone refers to the stone that somebody put on his tombstone after he was killed, because I think he became a hoodlum eventually. But... For the pubescent boys who were reading this book in the 1950s, the key scene was his house was very close to the neighbor's house. Oh, boy. (laughs) 
<laughs> and the neighbor girl was very cute. And they would up on in their separate bedrooms on the second story, start getting undressed in front of each other. Oh, my God. That, wow. became, that became a real thing. Wow. I just looked it up. 1952, Harold Robbins, A Stone for Danny Fisher. Oh, Harold Robbins wrote it. Yeah. yeah. There you yeah. Go. And, and I'm working on a joke. I have half a joke, something about uh, I'm going to go to my mother. You have to leave a stone at my mother's grave. Suppose it's a kidney stone. Suppose I piss on the grave and pass a kidney stone, Rabbi. Does that count? Something along those. Can you try that at Mary Shtickness for me to see if that works? I'll try that out. But if it doesn't go well, it's yours. If it goes well, it's mine. Why do we leave a stone at a grave? You're leaving a stone on a stone. You want to know the psychoanalytic reason? Yes, please. The it's reason. the testes. No. <laughs> You guys have a mind. I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> I know the, the origin of it. The, okay, let's hear the psychoanalytic, and then I'll explain what it really is. This ancient man was very afraid that people were going to come back, so they piled stones on top of the grave. Oh. I, my, my read is different. Ancient man was very afraid that they were going to lose their spot in line. So if you went... <laughs> to the funeral and you had to then go somewhere else. You put a stone to, to say there was no cutsies and no savesies, <laughs> but you were allowed to put the stone. Okay, hey, the days are getting longer. Yes. We're, we're, we're almost, we're coming into, into spring, right? The solstice. It means the, the days are, but you, was it you who calculated sunrise and sunset, Dr. Hershenfeld? And figured uh, out. I'm the first person who who discovered that sunrise and sunset take place <laughs> every day <laughs> at a specific time. Now, thank you for acknowledging that. But you also checked the farmer's almanac oh. or something. Oh, no, that was me. I was telling oh. you about that. I think yeah, I was telling you about that. So, the so we're told we're told theoretically. Yeah. That after December 21st, the days last longer. Yeah. True. But here's 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 what I was surprised to learn, because I checked the sunset times up here. Starting three days ago, sunset was already getting later. So sunset is already before the solstice starts getting later. But sunrise, it continues to get later for for those days. So the day, the point is that sunlight gets shortened. But I was just surprised to see that the sunrise is actually around December 18th. That's the, the earliest sun, uh, so, so early sunset. Nighttime comes earlier? Yes. Yeah. Be but is that because we've been messing with time? It's because we've ex been exploding atom bombs. I, I thought that might have been it. That's the reason. Yes. So... That's another, by the way, another nice thing about not flying. I haven't flown overseas since the pandemic. Uh, no jet lag. Yes. That's very a relief. Good. I like not having jet lag. I still I have a little bit need, of. I don't need to fly to have jet lag. I have been logy for the past yeah. since COVID. Yeah. I have just been eh, seamless. I don't yeah, feel I, going outside. I've, I'm a little tired since I was born. I, I think of it as womb lag. <laughs> yeah. So what are your plans for uh, Hanukkah and Christmas, Kwanzaa? What, what are your big plans, Dr. Hershenfeld? Why are you picking on me all the time? <laughs> I want to know because you're not going to go see your son. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I may, I'm considering it. I, I haven't quite, you know, the only reason I would, I love seeing him perform in the olden days when he first started, I would be so anxious when he performed. Is he going to remember? Is he going to fumble a line? Well, I was really in a panic. And then after a couple of years, I finally figured out 
He's a professional. He knows what he's doing. I can relax. So since then, I've just been relaxed. I felt that I had a very similar trajectory in thinking about you at your job. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, you know, that's true. Early on, it's a, it's a little frightening, <laughs> my job. But you but, have the advantage of you don't have to talk. Like if you're feeling, if you don't know your lines, you just... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Wait, now what, how do you take, you know, I've always been able to take my kids to work with me. Yeah. How do you take, if you're a psychiatrist, how do you take your children to work with you and to show them what you do? Yeah. We never, yeah, we were, we were uh, deprived of that. Yeah. But yeah, I think. Did I ever take it to the hospital when I was running inpatient wards? No, but uh, yeah, you once and you, and you left me there. <laughs> I'll be back. No, no, no. You took us once to when you were in medical school. I remember seeing the skeleton. You did take us to see the uh, the anatomy classroom, yeah. not the cadaver. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, was that was that traumatic to see a skeleton? No, it was cool. I liked that. Yeah. Could you have handled a cadaver? No, no, no. Yeah. I didn't even like. I didn't even like steak. <laughs> when you could see i was like a latent vegetarian for all those years because right i would just have to look away i mean you, sometimes you could identify a uh you know a uh a vein or a or a tendon or a nerve it's so gross right. i mean steak right. is just it is so gross anyway um dr hershenfeld do you remember your first cadaver yes we named her we had six people working around oh, her. Six, six. He said six. For the record, he said we had six. No, six <laughs> going around. Um, my my clearest memory from those days. It was November, nineteen sixty three. We had a Latvian professor of gross anatomy who lived and died, this was his only interest in the world, anatomy. So we were all standing around the cadaver, and he was tracing the vagus nerve, how it starts in the brainstem, goes back through the thorax, enervates, uh, the various organs in the abdomen were all peering all of a sudden. And he would always go like this with his glasses because he didn't want to get them dirty. So he would adjust them like this. Okay. All of a sudden, the door bangs in. It's November 22nd, 1963. And somebody yells, the president has been shot. Everybody freezes. He stops for about two seconds. He adjusts his glasses and then he says, and then if you'll notice. Wow. Wow. Uh, wow. I mean, so what you're saying is he knew that the assassination was going to happen. <laughs> That's well, he was from Wait. Latvia, so could have been. Yeah. And he pointed to the vagus nerve. He immediately went, the bullet entered, hit the vagus yeah. nerve. Now, the vagus nerve, I would think, where I come has from. An all, has an all-night buffet. <laughs> I, I was thinking, going back for six, that's the all, that's the all you can eat. But the, the vagus nerve. Yes. V-E-G-A-S? V-A, V-A-G-U-S, which comes from the Latin. It, it travels all over the place, like a vagabond. Or a vagrant. It goes, yeah. What's yeah. that? A vagrant. A vagrant. A vagrant. Right. Yeah. So it, it yeah. Wander, so it goes, it goes many places. Yeah. yeah. Or v vagary. Or can you be more vague? And my younger colleague here, <laughs> who goes swimming all the time in impossibly cold water, one of the theories of cold water swimming is that it's very relaxing because of its effect on the vagus nerve. 
I don't know if this is the truth or not, but that's. Yeah, that's what they say. Vagus nerve stimulation. Yeah. Yeah. And so we we should be familiar with our vagus nerve. It it runs the entire body. Uh, It peters out around your peter. (laughs) You know, lately, a lot of things have been petering out (laughs) around my peter. (laughs) The vagus nerve. All right. What are you reading? What are you reading? The flight of the vagus nerve. (laughs) I'm reading a terrific book. Maybe I mentioned this before. Um, This is the second time I'm reading it. It's called Austerlitz by Sebald, S-E-B-A-L-D, a German writer. It is just one of the great books. Okay. Truly. And will you be taking any, are you going to be traveling at all in the next two weeks? No. No, I'm listening to you. You said stay home. I'm I'm trying to, my war on the holidays. I follow all of your advice. Is it fair to say there, there might be a time in American history where maybe we shouldn't be celebrating? Maybe the snowpocalypse is Jesus's way of saying, you know, enough with the travel already, the climate change. The, this, the snowpocalypse is a message from the climate saying enough with the fossil fuels already. Stop with the with the, the, the celebrating and fix me. I think I mean, this is my very pessimistic view of human life. But I think it's going to take some major, major tragedies, the death of millions of people, for people to wake up and say, oh, yeah, maybe we've got to do something about this problem. As New York City washes away or something similar or or much more likely, Bangladesh completely washes away. With how many millions of people? I have no idea, but many millions of people. Right. Uh, Before we say goodnight, I'm looking at the chat room on YouTube. If you have a question for Dr. Samuel Benjamin, that you if you think there's a way he could help you get through the holiday season, put it in the chat room right now. And I'll ask Ethan. Yes. Are you reading while we're waiting for a question from the YouTube chat room? I'm, I'm I'm I've had my nose in the news. I really have. I, it's it's bad, but I have not been reading. A lot of people haven't been. Uh, yeah. And I did watch a great Netflix uh, Hulu, a series on Hulu, which I recommend highly. It's called Normal People came out right at the beginning of the pandemic. Somehow I missed it, but I just watched the whole thing or the first season. It's an Irish uh story it's a romance it takes place over a number of years it's great the acting and the writing just fantastic normal people on hulu that's my tip of the week okay go to mary stickmas christmas mary stickmas in, in in new york city if you're going to be in new york city go to eventbrite type in mary stickmas promo code ethan go yes. see this man perform there is nobody funnier Thank you. Uh, we, we have a question for, for the Hirschenfelds, which we'll get to in a second. We'll close with the question. But mm-hmm. please go buy Today Is Now by Dr. Samuel Benjamin. You buy it. Uh, where, where can you buy it? I can't say. Buy that. it at your own risk. I mean, buy it. It's guaranteed to change your life on Amazon. Uh, Dr. Samuel Benjamin. B- before it's your question, I just want to make. You're allowed to shop on. You're allowed to shop on Amazon for Christmas. Only to purchase this book today is now. Today is now. Today is now. Amazon.com. Jeff Bezos. Um, one other point I wanted to make before you ask your before we ask the question is just that you know with the rise of anti-Semitism. <laughs> yes. I just want to quickly say that I understand why people are annoyed with us. Um. We were talking. I was talking about how the the that C was was stolen from Hanukkah, and it's now right. just Hanukkah. But it's it's still not clear how to spell it. 
you can have two K's, you can have an H on the end with or without the C. There's more ways to spell Hanukkah than nights of Hanukkah. <laughs> and that's a problem. I can see why that would get some people annoyed with the Jewish people. So. Yeah. And but the H at the end is. Yeah. Uh, it's superfluous. It is superfluous. Yeah. yeah. L- let's let's get a movement going to get rid of the H. Yeah, we have to standardize it. We have to standardize. I think that might solve the whole anti-Semitism thing. If we could just agree on one spelling. Or maybe we could trade. You, earlier, you were saying that the Gentiles stole the C from Hanukkah. Yeah. Maybe we can give them the H. They give us back the C. They can call yeah, so it. So they'll, they'll be Chris Mash. Chris Mash. Okay. Good. All right. I think that would be better for aging people with bad dentures. They won't. I- they won't sound freakish when they pronounce it as Chris yeah. Mensch. That's the- people with a lateral lisp will love it. I think the guy to negotiate this deal is Jared Kushner. I'm going to call him. Okay. Uh, here we've got three questions. Question number one from uh, S. Kowalchuk. I had a death in the family this year, and my mother is declining with Alzheimer's disease. My question is, what question should I ask you? Okay, that's funny. What, what is the meaning of life? That's what he should ask us. And what is the meaning of life? I don't know. I know. Oh, good. the meaning of life is just to be kind to other creatures. That's it. Okay. There's I'll nothing else. That. There's nothing else to do. I say the meaning of life is death. That since we're all going to die. You might as well treat people like crap. Because I just I just read the death of Ivan Ilyich by Tolstoy, hmm. and it's a great book. And 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 that's the the message from Tolstoy. Hmm. The Which meaning is what? of life is to be kind. There you go, Tolstoy. I, I feel like I'm in good company. And All right, what's guy, the next question? Let's bang this out. Well, uh, was Jesus a Republican? <laughs> I don't know. He was Jewish. Uh, not too many Jews are Republicans. Right. I'll tell you, he was not. He was not a Republican because Republicans uh, don't wear sandals. <laughs> That's, oh, and, there, there's no open toed shoes in the Republican Party. Right. What? And uh, I can't read that. But what challenges do you see that need to be addressed in the field of psychology. These are questions for Dr. Hershenfeld, not me. You can ask me questions later. <laughs> okay, you want a serious answer to that? Yeah, and then we'll wrap it up. The um, what the biggest challenge is that the um, psychiatry, insurance agent, government uh Cabal has decided that the cheapest way to make people better is by giving them pills. And it helps a little, but it ain't the whole story. Right. You can't talk to a pill. There you go. We'll end on that. Thank you, Dr. Hershenfeld. And thank you, David Feldman. Okay. And, and fake Dr. Hershenfeld. Thank you. Go buy, I'm telling you, if you want to laugh, go buy Dr. Samuel Benjamin's book, Today is Now. Today is now. And it gets the Feldman guarantee. If you if this book doesn't make you laugh out loud, I will let me know. I'll reimburse you and bring this to Mary Stickmas. And Ethan will autograph it and probably buy you a cup of coffee. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Merry war on Christmas. Merry Christmas. Ho, 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 ho. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you all to our live studio audience in the Zoom room. We kind of called this at the last minute. We're easing back into the live shows. And thank you to those of you watching right now on YouTube. This was last minute. So thank you. If you're enjoying this segment of the David Feldman show, please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong.
and protect the weak. All right, we're going to go to Norway to see Joe and find out what he's cooking. Welcome to the professors and Mary Ann. Joining us in Kingston, Ontario, is Professor Adnan Hussein. He is chairman of the religion department at Queen's University. Joining us in Connecticut is Professor Ann Lee. You can read her over at the Daily Cause every night uh, under the handle Annie Lee. She does a nightly update on the war in Ukraine. Professor Mary Ann Cummings is a particle physicist who believes all politics is local. That's why she is Parks Commissioner for Aurora, Illinois, the second largest city in Illinois. And Professor Jonathan Bick teaches Star Trek and the Twilight Zone at office hours every Friday and Saturday. Welcome. First, we have to do ASMR for the eyeballs. Joe in Norway will be cooking for us. Before we bring in Joe on today's episode of The Professors and Marianne, we're going to be talking about uh, George Santos, the international man of mystery, as I think Professor Ann Lee refers to him, is a, a Congress Republican congressman who is a liar, even for a Republican. He is a liar. We're going to find out what's in the one point seven trillion dollar spending bill. We're going to talk about Zelensky's speech before Congress and the Kafala system in Qatar. I think uh, that might be the most interesting of all the topics because I think it's the least covered. Let's go to Norway, where our resident chef, Joe, is outside in Norway. Is that snow for real? That is snow. I was I managed to dig my myself out so that in preparation of the uh, the uh, Chinese stir fry for Christmas, we can uh, season my brand new wok. So uh-huh. instead of so, I have my professional restaurant uh, burner here, and we'll be slowly. The seasoning the surface on the top and the bottom, and it'll eventually go from this is a carbon steel walk. It'll go from no patina to something along the lines of this one. Okay, and you're going to be cooking what for us? No, I'm not cooking. I'm seasoning the walk. So (laughs) you basically, I'm creating a nonstick surface on it. So instead of uh, those non non-stick surfaces we we create a natural one with the the oil residue so i'll be slowly burning this all evening all right we will be watching thank you joe in the way it looks delicious i said ironically (laughs) boy am i hungry (laughs) professor ann lee (laughs) professor ann lee writes a nightly update on the war in ukraine tell us what is going on in the in, in Ukraine, and what did you think of Zelensky's speech? It's a fascinating speech. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Uh, it's an excellent speech, well crafted. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Zelensky talked about uh, he he made the kind of important connections aside from the usual issues of someone being a non-native English speaker. Uh, presenting a speech in English, uh, he he hit all the points that he has hit before in speeches to uh, the the United States to Congress, the Battle of the Bulge in 1944, uh, mainly because of its uh, uh, concurrence with uh, Christmas time, but more importantly, and I think it was important to him as well, and he'd said this before, but uh, made more poignant, I suppose, the Battle of Saratoga. 1777, which for uh, some historians, uh, the turning point in the American Revolutionary War, it's a a clear victory uh, with several sequential elements to it, but uh, uh, a truly important battle relative to the battles that that were fought. Um, Although I suppose you could make Trenton a a close second. Which was also around Christmas time, I believe. Exactly. Uh, These are important elements, I think, of a history that uh, uh, 
that Zelensky was uh, uh, paying attention to. I, I'm more fascinated about the small logistics of these matters. You know, they 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 left it open until the last minute. They flew him on board a, uh, a much smaller jet, probably for maneuverability and other things, uh, uh, 737. They have 20 of them. The, the United States has 20 737s, which is like having your own. Uh, I mean, those are commercial commercial type air, aircraft. There's no you know, weapons on these 737s. Um, right. But anyway, it's just interesting that uh, uh, they they gave him a sort of circuitous route. Uh, took the train into Poland and flew out of uh, Poland. Um, these may seem uh, not important matters, but actually there was very strict security. So there, there was uh, it was a very interesting, interesting speech, uh, partially because it, it had the usual elements of uh, a theater, a flag signed by troops that he had visited in Bakhmut the, the, just the day before, presented to Congress, uh, which was made for a very good photo op. Um, they gave him a, a U.S. flag that he'll take back with him. Sort of that that was interesting, um, you know, sort of the, the usual theatrics. Uh, Matt Gates and uh, Lauren Boebert uh, uh, showed up to the speech, but didn't stand up, uh, didn't applaud. Um, the uh, the the construction of the speech the me- and they wouldn't go through the metal detectors, right? Oh, they breezed through the metal detectors. Uh, you know, it uh, it was very interesting. Um, but from a security point of view, it, it was a fairly closed session in the sense that the gallery only had people invited by Zelensky. Uh, you know, it was a kind of speech uh, that that had issues mainly because of being presented by a non-native speaker. But, uh, you know, who knew enough English to. Uh, deliver the the couple of jokes that were built into there and uh, uh, people were responsive to it. I I think that, uh, uh, you know, it was important because it had a big audience, you know, uh, but the thing is, uh, what did he walk away with? He's walking away with Patriot missiles and he said he's going to need more, that there's no. That's it's always more. His his message has never really changed. I mean, essentially, it was the same message. Uh, Patriot missiles were we've only given them one battery, which is a uh, complex of several different uh, launchers. But it includes, a, a, you know, a radar system and a variety of other things. Uh, and it's a, it's a very important interceptor system because it's designed for multi-stage uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. In other words, if for some reason and this is not dependent on nuclear uh, warheads or not, uh, if uh, Putin suddenly goes crazy and decides he's going to launch the much larger uh, multi-stage intercontinental ballistic multi-warhead missiles at uh, uh, Ukraine. This is what's going to stop them. Uh, the current right. sets of uh, missile defense are not going to stop him to stop that type of missile. What is your sense with our Congress? Because. Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans are taking over the House and they're saying Zelensky doesn't have a blank check anymore. Is that the sense you got? Uh, yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the the margin is so close <clears throat> that votes are going to be fought over rather uh, vociferously. And um, the best I think that the GOP can demand are audits of uh you know, accountability is is the kind of issue. There's a subtext that's being uh, promoted by pro-Russian media that um, um, U.S. weapons are being uh, uh, siphoned away or resold somewhere. Right. There's no proof to this, but it, this There's is no a, inspector. We don't have an inspector general looking at <laughs> we. We have inspector generals. It's just that this hasn't been paid big, uh, great attention to, I think, uh, partially for flexibility and also for intelligence. You really don't want to tell them what you're sending. Um, there's a lot of stuff that got sent that is not being um, mentioned to uh, the press or in general. I think there's some transparency, but there's a lot of things that are just sitting in Europe uh, being wait, waiting for uh, transfer to uh, the Ukrainians. So that's but kind what of what's going think, on. Right what now. does Zelensky think is a best case scenario? Because 
from my perspective, it looks like Ukraine has been decimated. You have six to seven million refugees who've left the country, and then you have more refugees internally. What is the how does this end well for him? Well, what could end well is say whether a major counteroffensive in the spring works or or whether he they successfully blunt what is being uh, touted in the spring as a major Russian offensive. Uh, both of these elements are problematic for all kinds of reasons. But, uh, uh, you know, I mean, as a personal opinion, I think they need to uh, do the best they can to strike a major blow against the Russian forces and place themselves in a good position for negotiation. Um, the fact is that negotiation has always been going on. It's just been, you know, it's very sub rosa. And uh, it's pretty clear that both sides are uh, retaining their own position. There's a 10 point uh, plan that uh, um, uh, uh, Zelensky made to uh, uh, the EU that is, uh, you know, it's not an unreasonable plan. He just wants Russian troops out of the damn country. Uh, and the, the problem, of course, is that he, that. Uh, They'd like to go to the pre-2014 borders, and that's really a, a tough, a, a great difficulty unless the uh, Ukrainians can drive the Russians back a significant amount. That that does not appear at the present moment to be possible. So um, we're looking at World War One with the hope of a spring offensive. We're seeing yes. trench warfare with algorithms, as I understand it, and this could uh, go is going to go on and on until. Anthony Blinken and uh, Lavrov. Joe, I'm sorry. And Lavrov sit down anyway. Yes. And, and, and work it out. Yes. Yes. That's what that's the way I would predict it. There's pressure. There is pressure uh, from the West because of all of the economic constraints to, to get to a some kind of solution. The problem, of course, is that Ukraine is pretty serious about not wanting any Russians anywhere. Right. So before so we open it up to our I, I want to get the other professors uh, take on this, and I'm sure they have some questions they want to ask you. I have a problem with Matt Gates, Lauren Boebert, Jackson Hinkle, the, the people who are either anti Zelensky or pro Putin. Uh, they seem to be either fake uh, leftists or genuine Republicans. And I am not smart enough to to figure everything out, but I don't like the people who are siding with Putin and are up against, you know, Tucker Carlson is against Zelensky and is in favor of uh, Putin. So what, why is it that way? Why do we find the right wing so enthralled by uh, by Putin and so antagonistic towards Ukraine and Zelensky. Why why do we see Boebert and Matt Gates not standing up? Well, it's uh, partially it's simply reactionary uh, relative to uh, the Democrats in, in charge. But I think there's also a through line that goes back to Russian influence in the Republican Party. And, uh, you know, they're. They're not talking a lot about these kinds of things, but, uh, you know, Rand Paul comes up with these quite bizarre uh, positions uh, on uh, uh, attacking Zelensky and, and a variety of other things. Uh, there's plenty of disinformation, uh, incredible amounts of disinformation being produced. And uh, the Republicans take advantage of it because it is a kind of uh, uh, it, it doesn't need accountability. And, and you can take all kinds of weird positions without a lot of uh, pushback from mainstream media uh, asking them questions about their wacky positions. That's um, quite well, similar. If you, were to ask, if you were to ask Matt Gates and Lauren Boebert or Tucker Carlson how they wanted this to end, what would they say? Oh, uh, they they're. Uh, they're taking an America first line. You know, we shouldn't be spending money. On, do they uh, want Putin to foreign aid? Do they want Putin to succeed in Ukraine? No, they just simply simply want to oppose American aid that is going 
abroad uh, internationally, which, you know, has allies in a variety of places. It's an economic argument, you know, where uh, do they but they don't believe that Russia and Ukraine are the same country. Uh, no, I don't. I don't think they really care. I think what they want to do is weaken Democrats. It's all. It's all a domestic thing. It really has very little to do with actual foreign policy, uh, because I think they're both clueless about it. And that's at the one level. So they're simply towing a a kind of safe line of opposition to whatever Democrats are doing. It's it's very reactionary, at least in from that. And and in fact, the fact that Mitch McConnell is taking a much more middle of the road position. I don't know. It's really not quite a middle, but he's more conciliatory. conciliatory. He at least likes shaking hands with Zelensky, unlike, uh, uh, you know, other people who won't shake uh, uh, McConnell's hand. But uh, so there is a sort of a middling position that uh, uh, Republican leadership is taking relative to this, even though the extremists would like to have audits and inspector generals and a variety of other things. Right. And there's no Russiagate connection here with Republicans doing uh, Putin's bidding. Um, not really, although I think some of that could break open. I, who knows uh, when we get to the full scale um, uh, select committee report? There may be things in the interstices that will pop up. I don't think that they're going to come up from the select committee report, but ultimately, and I think this is ultimately when the DOJ finally gets around to prosecuting and delivering indictments, we're going to see some interference. We're going to see some element there that that comes from external forces trying to make hay out of uh, the insurrection. You're talking about Jack Smith and the. Yes. The council looking into Trump. Uh, Professor Adnan Hussein wasn't here last week. So your response, please. Oh, we'll well, I would say that I think I agree with Anne about a lot of it having to do with domestic reactive uh, responses to the Democrats. However, I do think there is an element of um, conservative uh you know, interest in um, Putin as a kind of figure of the global right, um, as a conservative leader of a powerful Christian nation who is opposing, you know, some elements of the global liberal order that, um, you know, these folks see as part of the corporate uh, Hollywood culture that is being, you know, um, aggressively pushed in their view on in undermining the family and, and so on. So they do see Putin as something of an ally, as a hero standing up to uh, this kind of process. Uh, this goes back in some ways, perhaps you could say to the uh, Steve uh, Bannon um, interest in forging some kind of uh, Eurasian uh, kind of a Western cultural camp to oppose China and, you know, other parts of the world that are inimical or dangerous to Western culture and civilization. And so there's an interest in, you know, perhaps seeing him as a kind of Christian leader and never mind that it's Orthodox Eastern uh, form of Christianity, but perhaps we can overlook some of these historic differences since, you know, there's a much greater gulf culturally, uh, um, uh, civilizationally in their way of thinking, because that's the way that they think. They think about these in terms of racial and cultural. And, and he's ethnic. white civilizational blocks. Yes, exactly. So I do think that, you know, given that, you know, he is sort of standing up for a kind of nationalism, he represents a kind of, you know, attempt at withdrawing from, you know, the neoliberal global regime that they uh, have their own beef or problems with. Um, so they can kind of have this, um, you know, sort of fantastical you know, a sense of Putin as a, a better alternative in some ways than a liberal Democrat, democratic leader, neoliberal in this corporate 
kind of and you know you see that with tucker carlson he's been railing against you know corporate elites and so on so this is a kind of global alliance of conservative populist nationalist reaction um i think um right. so that's one one way in which it, it might be genuine you know from the mouths of babes uh 24 year old nick fuentes the nazi i've played clips of him saying I'm rooting for Putin. I'm rooting against Zelensky. Somebody's talking in his ear. So I don't know enough. But when I see Nick Fuentes siding with Putin and Tucker Carlson siding with Putin, I think, well, I don't want to be on their side. I know that they're dishonest. Well, see, that's the problem of like this reactive. Now, what Anne had talked about, about this kind of reactive, polemical uh, a form of politics that we've gotten ourselves trapped into. So simply because some right wing nuts are taking a, uh, you know, pro Putin stance mm. doesn't mean that there isn't a reason to be pushing for a quick settlement, right. to be realistically assessing that all nations, you know, great powers and other nations all have their interests and their right, you know, and are going to pursue them and that we need to be cognizant of that in diplomacy if we want to avoid disastrous results for the global economy or for, you know, security of the world by, you know, escalating into uh, nuclear war. So, you know, just because there are some awful, terrible people for the wrong reasons, right. you know, supporting Putin doesn't mean that we should all be in immediately in the camp of um, pro war in Ukraine. I think that's the problem right. is that we're getting trapped into this sort of reactive, polemical uh, way of thinking rather than independently pursuing, you know, a reasonable policy based on our values uh, for, you know, the agenda that we'd like to see, which is, you know, greater equality, economic and social justice and peace. I mean, we've forgotten about peace as a right. major organizing principle on the left. And this reminds me so much of why there is emerging a real sense of non-aligned states geopolitically who don't want to be corralled into one camp or the other uh, in the U.S. rules-based order versus the authoritarians and that we should not do business with and have no relation with, uh, you know, these authoritarian states. Well, India, uh, states, you know, countries in Africa, this is the reason why Biden had to hold this recent conference of 49 African countries that he invited and organized because they didn't fall in line, you know, in eight, nine, ten months ago when, uh, you know, we were demanding, the U.S. government was demanding every nation has to participate in this sanctions regime. And they said, no, we don't want to because we need the fertilizer from Russia. We need the grain from Russia. We need the oil and natural gas from Russia. And we shouldn't be pressured into adhering to um, an aggressive, um, you know, position of having to choose sides that you're either with us or against us. I mean, it's just like George Bush during the global war on terrorism. You're either with us or you're against us. And so what's happening now is the emergence of a kind of non-aligned sort of movement. And that's the movement that I see on the left in Europe is moving. You know, Yanis uh, Varoufakis and Jeremy Corbyn and others are talking about having a sensible foreign policy um, of non-alignment. And it reminds me so much of the era of Bandung and the non-aligned movement that tried during the previous Cold War, because what we're seeing is the attempt to establish a new Cold War environment um, against you know, China and against Russia, um, is uh, many countries that want to be able to have uh, positive trading, commercial and geopolitical relations with any set of countries that suits their interests and allows them to advance uh, and achieve their economic and and other other needs. So I, I think that's the path that we have to uh, adhere to and not get trapped into this uh, kind of polemical Cold War sort of reactive thinking. OK, uh, so here's what I'd like to do. I know that Professor Marianne has some very strong opinions and I want to hear them. 
I really do. But I want to go to Professor Bick first and give Professor Cummings the last word on all this. Well, uh, David, I um, I agree with much of what uh, Professor Hussein has said. Um, I think a couple of important questions to ask, you know, when you kind of step back uh, from this is to say uh, is to ask, you know, is the integrity of Ukraine's borders worth the risk of a nuclear war? That's an important question to ask. It's easy for me to answer. No. Is the integrity of Ukraine's borders worth a expanded war in Europe where hundreds of thousands of more people are likely to die, if not millions? Uh, again, the answer for me is no. Uh, the best outcome for this war would be to have all the Russians get it the hell out of Ukraine. I agree with that. Do I think that's likely to happen without one of those other two things going on? I don't know, but it seems like too much of a risk for me. OK, uh, you know, if Putin is this horrible guy and he certainly yeah. seems to be, um, you know, why are people dismissing the idea that he might use nuclear weapons? Doesn't seem to to work there. You know, he's the, he's a he's a horrible, murderous uh, dictator, but he would never use nuclear weapons. That's out of the question. And if he did, what would be the implications of that? I would think they would be very, very bad, much worse than if we had to compromise, if Ukraine had to compromise and give up, you know, part of its uh, territory to Russia in order to end this thing. Um, so those are two fundamental questions that I, okay. I think people don't answer, you know, let ask me, or answer. Let, let me ask Professor Marianne Cummings a difficult question. You're a particle physicist and uh, President Biden has said or hinted that if he, uh, Putin uses nuclear weapons, he will not respond in kind. They're, they're probably the Pentagon will just take out the, the, the you know, use other means to get uh, even. As a particle physicist, you and you you're with the Fermi Lab. This is a horrible question to ask. Uh, are there nuclear weapons that can be used, uh, tactical nuclear weapons that can be used on the battlefield that would give a Chernobyl-like radioactive cloud that uh, wouldn't uh, create a nuclear winter, but enough damage to... Uh, yeah, to look, you know, um, back during the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, there was that famous uh, incident that Noam Chomsky and others had had uh, talked about, where um, we had fired on th on three Soviet submarines that were in international waters at the time, and the three of those submarine commanders that they all agreed to launch had the authority to launch nuclear weapons. Right, but now, before the weapons you, before they had... Hang on, just say, answer, because this is a difficult question. No, but I... A tactical nuclear weapon. Yeah, a tactical well, nuclear weapon wouldn't, in and of itself, do a lot of damage globally. I mean, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, I mean, you know, in the spring. I mean, what would happen? Actually, this, is a, this is a legitimate question. It's an uncomfortable yeah, I understand question. what you're like asking. If he used a nuclear bomb on Kiev, God forbid, but this is what we're talking about. He drops a nuclear bomb and erases, turns Kiev into glass the way we turned Hiroshima and Nagasaki into glass. Are we looking at a nuclear winter? What, what are we looking at? I if, think if it were one or two bombs, no, that's not the problem. The problem 
wasn't that, you know, if the submarine commanders had launched their their they had nuclear weapons, would they have taken out the entire eastern seaboard? No. But the fact that they would have launched one nuclear weapon that hit the United States would have set out a chain reaction from NORAD. I don't know when everybody talks about limited nuclear war. I mean, who's the people who which side stops using their nuclear weapons? Well, Joe Biden, again, if you could answer my question, yeah. because I'm curious. Joe Biden has said he's not going to respond in kind with a nuclear weapon. So, again, this is, yeah. you know, an apocalyptic scenario. Putin uses the nuclear bomb uh, uh, on Kiev. It's a horrible thing to think about. It's the unthinkable. But. What does that mean in terms of just that bomb? Well, I think it's more important what it means for the people in Kiev. I obviously, but we we did drop a bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. and there wasn't a nuclear winter. So no, there was not. So nuclear bombs, this is uncomfortable to say this, but nuclear bombs can be used in in a limited fashion during war. Yes. Those are tiny bombs compared to what Russia has. Well, not only we're that, about, but we're talking about tactical nuclear weapons. But, not- but that's exactly it. You're thinking that once something's used in a tactical sense, we could limit what happens thereafter. If there was to be a nuclear bomb dropped anywhere in the Western world, what do you think the response Again, I'm, I'm, that's not my question. My well, question. no, I know that wasn't your question, but that's the thing. I mean, what happens if if at one of these international meetings, the evil Putin comes out and he knifes Joe Biden to death? Would that be horrible for the world? Well, yeah, because well, I, I guess we have we a have horrible to... psychological reaction that would be an act of war. So what I'm but, you know, so it's not We're raising the threat of a nuclear war. So. We keep hearing that he's dusting off the nuclear weapons and it's an abstraction. We should figure out what that actually means. Like, what are the numbers? We we should know that answer. And. uh, Yeah, we have that answer. I mean, we can extrapolate from what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We can even extrapolate from what happened in Chernobyl. I mean, we know, look, people have done studies Literally, if you ever saw the movie Dr. Strangelove, right. the binders that Buck Turgidson right. had, one of them was like post-nuclear scenarios and megadeths. That was a real title of a real But he'd style. also be, uh, the reason, the other reason I bring this up and then I'll drop oh. it is Belarus would be devastated. If he bombed, drops a mm-hmm. nuclear bomb on Kiev, it will destroy southern Russia it would destroy uh, Belarus. It would also destroy the four provinces that he's recognized as part of Russia. So uh, that's why I don't think he's going to use a nuclear weapon because I don't he'd be killing he his own people. Uh, I don't know what the percentage of Ukrainians speak Russian. He's, I just don't see him using a nuclear bomb on his own people like we said of Saddam Hussein. Uh, very quickly, let, let's get your reaction on Zelensky's speech, Professor Marion. And then I want to talk about what's in the one point seven trillion dollar funding bill. That- yeah, Zelensky is all PR and Zelensky is our puppet. I mean, he's put there for for PR purposes and nothing else. My question is, you know, we had there was a serious deal and we know know how serious it was that they were on the brink of actually having a peace agreement by the beginning of April last year. What was the gain to the West for eight, seven more months of, eight more months of continued war? Because now I doubt very much after all that's happened that Russia is even going to go back to the Minsk Accords. I think at the very least, he's going to keep the land bridge to Crimea and they're they're basically going to take the entire Donbass region and they're going to have it super fortified at this point. 
So uh, my question is, somebody wanted that war to continue. And there were certainly enough people. people, there are certainly enough people in our Pentagon. I mean, uh, Professor Lee and Lee is right. I mean, the propaganda is just, you know, thick and furious both sides. But I think that most people have a very clouded understanding of what's really going on there. I think there's a reason why the occasional counter narrative to the the whole uh, narrative on Ukraine, most exclusively comes in, in the United States comes from the Defense Department because they know. Uh, so knowing that you know they uh, it, that uh, they 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 had a reason for squashing this agreement, they knew what Russia had. They knew that Russia was in there with less than a tenth of their active army. Um, Russia, you know, they're devastating the energy grid right now. They could have done that in the first week of this war. Why didn't they? You know, if they wanted complete and utter takeover and ruin of Kiev, they could have just done it. You know, put aside exotic things like nuclear weapons and bio weapons and chemical weapons aside. They have incredible amounts of conventional firepower. They could have just taken the country out if they wanted to. You know, why go through all of this, you know, this very gradualistic, I guess, partly political. They wanted, you know, the Donetsk and Luhansk forces were, you know, were at the front lines. This this uh, collection of uh, contracting companies known as the Wagner Wagner Group was uh, at, in one part of Donetsk. Um Why just this slow burn? I think they wanted something. And actually... You know, they it, at the very beginning, it seemed at least within a month of that war, they seemed on the verge of getting what they said they wanted. And which right. was, you know, it turned to the Minx Accords. They got rid of the Azov Battalion. Well, they were doing that while they were whilst they were in Turkey and negotiating. But, you know, that they wanted to denazify. Um, but, you know, uh NATO has come in much more heavily and, if, you know, there's just been a gradual, you know, sort of escalation of this war. As the economies of Europe are collapsing, our people are, their people are facing real hunger and, and fuel shortages. As the ruble is stronger than it's ever been, as the world has realigned, <laughs> there's, looks like there is a multipolar world, as was discussed previously, and, you know, the third world countries in South America and Africa are just have had it. I mean, it's not just that the United States is no longer it, the only bully in town or the only strong man in town. I mean, the condensation and the racism, which I really hadn't quite appreciated, but I was reading a foreign policy article of last month where they're going on about well, why are African leaders so susceptible to Russian propaganda? How condescending. How, you know, it's like, like you don't think these guys are grownups that can look at this set of mofos over here and that set of mofos over there and figure out which ones they're going to go with for their own reasons? I mean, the... Uh, there was uh, a couple of gals uh, right after the this conference they invited that Biden invited this meeting of African leaders. There was one woman and I wish I remembered her name, but she was on uh, Democracy Now. And she was trying politely as she could <laughs> to not call Biden and the Biden administration racist. But she were, used exactly this kind of words like condescending, paternalistic you know, assuming that the Africans don't know, you know, what's in their best interests. And, you know, they both guess on, on Amy Goodman's show was saying, look, the whole uh, state, state Department diplomatic apparatus of the United States is going to have to relearn how to be diplomats and how to deal with other countries as Equal wouldn't be the world, but word, but with respect. And he right. said that's a that's a culture that they're going to have to start developing, right quick. Okay, let us now turn to this one point seven trillion dollar spending bill that I believe eighteen Republicans in the Senate 
voted in favor of, even though they said they weren't? Professor Jonathan Hick. Yes. So today the uh, Senate passed one point seven trillion dollar omnibus spending bill. Uh, It was a vote of 68 to 29 in the Senate. And uh, it needs to pass the House, which it's expected to do tomorrow. And then President Biden would sign it into law. Uh, So uh, about half of it uh, goes to the military. And eight hundred and fifty eight billion dollars in military funding, which is more than the Pentagon asked for, which always seems to be the case. Um, And about seven hundred and seventy two billion for domestic uh, spending. So. um, There were several things that had to be dropped uh, that the Democrats said they wanted to uh, include in this, um, such as expanded expanded monthly payment to families with children. So that would have been the uh, you know extension of the uh, expanded tax credit for children that we had for one year uh, during COVID, uh, which pulled about 40, 45 percent of uh, uh, children out of poverty. Uh, But no, that was not included in this. Uh, Republicans were not going to vote for that. Um, A new round of emergency pandemic aid that was not included either um, because we're pretending like the pandemic's over, even though it appears to be exploding in China now that they have uh, gotten rid of their zero covid policy there. A, uh, uh, they also wanted, which was not included, a pathway to permanent legal status for Afghan refugees. <clears throat> that was not included, uh, unbelievably, right? So the United States spends two decades destroying Afghanistan. And, um, you know, the people that worked for us, mm-hmm. that worked with the United States government, to help them, quote unquote, win there. Uh, They're not provided a path to legal status in this country because staying there is a danger to many of these people's lives. Right now that the Taliban is running the country. Also, what another thing that was pushed for, but was not included in this was marijuana banking legislation. So to allow uh, banks to handle money that comes from the sale of uh, businesses that sell and grow marijuana, which are which is legal in some states in the United States. That did not pass either. Senators Richard Shelby of Alabama and Mitch McConnell. Of- Am I losing you? Hi, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? John? I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, something happened. Uh, please continue. OK. Uh, Richard Shelby of Alabama and Mitch McConnell, uh, head of the Republicans um, in the Senate. Uh, they uh, hailed the increase in military spending and claimed credit for forcing Democrats to accept it without an equal increase in domestic programs. So they're very proud of the fact that they are keeping children in poverty in the United States that, you know, good for them. That's, that's an achievement for Republicans. Um, There were a bunch of amendments that were added, uh, including a billion dollars for the health fund for emergency responders and survivors of September 11th attacks. Um, They also approved an amendment that would allow the administration to sell the seized assets of Russian oligarchs and put the money toward rebuilding Ukraine. That's a good thing. I mean, anytime you can take assets of oligarchs. uh, We should try it in this country. Yes, exactly. Um, They also include legislation that would make it uh, a federal law to guarantee protections and accommodations for pregnant workers and a measure that would require breastfeeding accommodations in the workplace. So that's that's a positive. 
Um, the Electoral Reform Act. Electoral Reform Act, right. Which, which will prevent. That's a big thing if you're concerned about uh, certifying elections. Like the Eastman plan, state legislatures overriding the popular vote and sending their own slate of electors to Washington on January 6th. That has now been written out of the law. Right. Which begs uh, the question, how against the law was it that, you know, what John Eastman dreamed up with the, can you really prosecute Eastman for sending fake electors to Washington if you had to write a law to make it illegal after the fact? Different episode of the show. Go continue. Okay. Uh, although we, we need to watch this case in front of the Supreme Court, uh, which, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the conservatives could say, we don't care what the people voted for. We'll let the state legislatures in each state decide uh, who gets the electoral votes right in a presidential election. Gee, that's a nice thing. Isn't it? Yes. Uh, just shit on democracy one more time. Um, yeah. So and what else do we have? in there? Oh, yeah, we had um, fifteen point six billion dollars for weapons and munitions. Uh, many of this is going, of course, to Ukraine uh, or to replenish Pentagon stockpiles because they've been providing all this, uh, these war materials to uh, Ukraine. So they, we got to stock up again. And then, uh, you know, the uh, military industrial complex is doing quite well at this. Mm -hmm. So feeding them. And it also allocates four and a half billion dollars to develop and field hypersonic weapons and related advanced technology, an area in which some experts say the United States is lagging behind rivals like China. Yes. So this is a, you know, an arms race uh, a la the Cold War. Um, Republicans won funding to uh, uh, sorry, funding cuts to the IRS. Right. Uh, After the um, Inflation Reduction Act. Well, th that that is still in place. So the IRS is going to get an 80 billion dollar boost under that bill that the Democrats passed. Uh, but Republicans apparently are uh, between when that goes into effect and, and now they, they got cuts for the IRS um, because they want to uh, harm the funding source of this country. Right. They want that's what they want to do. They want to make it harder for the government to collect money so that we can run this country. Right. How are we going to uh, pay for it? Well, first you collect what's owed to us. Exactly. I mean, for every dollar that we spend, uh, that we add to the IRS budget, I, I believe it, we get back like four dollars in return. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really a uh, a deficit reduction act to mm -hmm. to increase the funding of the IRS. But Republicans are against that. <laughs> OK, so we we uh, let, let, we have to move on to the next subject. So yeah. anything else that we should know about? Uh, let's see. Uh, Bernie Sanders uh, was successful in uh, including 50 million dollars, uh, which is, you know, a drop in the bucket when you're talking about billions. But uh, 50 million dollars uh, to support funding of um, uh, initiatives to encourage worker ownership in uh, businesses. So that's an interesting little interesting. item. Yeah. OK, uh, let's talk to a Professor Hussein about the Kafala system. I have no idea what this is. It's in Qatar. What does this mean? Oh, well, <clears throat> the Kafala system has uh, come to be uh, uh, suddenly rather well known because of the attention given to the problem of migrant workers, their abuse and exploitation in the uh, Gulf state of uh, Qatar um, and the parallel. I mean, it's often you know, neglected that, of course, this is a problem throughout the Gulf monarchies. Uh, so Kuwait, 
UAE, Saudi Arabia, um, Bahrain. Uh, these countries all have a unique um, labor and citizenship system that controls um, foreign workers uh, who are the predominant and majority population in many of these countries. So a place like Qatar has a few hundred thousand um, Qataris, sort of native Qataris, but, um, you know, two million or so uh, foreign workers from all over the world, everybody from uh, you know, other uh, Arab countries to South Asian, uh, East Asian, Philippines, Indonesians. Um, so there, there's a kind of global labor regime of foreign workers who uh, are under particular uh, strictures in uh, Qatar where they have to have um, entry and residency visas. Um, they have exit visas. Uh, in order to leave the country, uh, you have to have a no objection certificate. Um, and essentially, you sometimes you also have to have a surety or a money deposit that is made by the sponsor uh, to guarantee for any costs associated with the migrant worker absconding or being repatriated. And essentially, you have to have your employer as a sponsor in order to have um, the ability to work which in, in Qatar or these other countries, which obviously gives your employer a great deal of leverage that can be exploited. Um, and so these are very harsh conditions um, that are thought to be, um, you know, some kind of unique system indigenous to the Gulf region because of its kind of backward uh, oriental uh, hierarchies or, you know, Bedouin tribal. Sometimes the origins of the kafala system are thought to be in the origins of, you know, Bedouin tribal um, uh, relations with guests where they would, you know, be a sponsor and offer protection to somebody who is outside the tribe or a visitor and so on, which is a technique that you see in conditions where you don't have a kind of centralized state, right? In tribal societies, the stranger, you know, has to be sponsored and afforded protection because there isn't like a legal regime in an organized form of justice that protects their rights. There's no police, you know, system and so on. So it's thought that it has its origins there or in Islamic law. Um, you know, where a kafala is a kind of form of sponsorship. Often it's used for somebody providing surety in the case of like bail, um, like that they provide kind of the um, uh, surety that they will make sure this person shows up to trial and in the meantime won't get into trouble and so on, right? <clears throat> the difference is, is that this system has somehow been applied to labor and organizing labor. Uh, and so the question is, well, where does this actually originate and how was it developed? Well, if you know anything about the history of the Gulf, you know that all of these little statelets are uh, tribal, uh, you know, Bedouin uh, communities that came under British protection and control, um, principally because of uh, British imperial interests in the Indian Ocean and in India. And they extended their control to the Gulf, particularly in order to control and profit from the pearling industry. This is a era, era, you know, where seasonal pearl diving um, uh, took place, and particularly in Bahrain. And in Bahrain, they established this system of basically imperial management of labor uh, coming from the region during the seasonal period where every, you know people from Iran or other Iraq and other neighboring regions would come to Bahrain for the pearling season um, and, and work. Um, and also as uh, they expanded and as oil was discovered uh, and they formed this, you know, these British, you know, petroleum uh, companies to um, 
exploit oil resources. They had to import quite a lot of labor, uh, both for the oil industry, but then also with the larger population, domestic labor uh, that they thought wasn't uh, available or appropriate from local sources. So they brought people from South Asia in the 1920s. They started establishing and expanded in the 30s, 40s and 50s. Um, you know, as the oil industry took off. And so it really was the British who created the sponsorship system for labor in order to manage these populations when they had short staff and they didn't want, you know, it was difficult to control and monitor the expanding labor population. So like so many British, you know, approaches of indirect rule, they, you know, delegated this down from the state. The state would have an overall, um, you know, review of this and ha- and be the one to give these visas. But they sort of put the control and management of this labor population upon the employers. And it first started with ship captains of the purling vessels that they sort of offshored this, that you are responsible for your workers. You have to make sure that you know, if they're foreign to this area, that you provide a surety, you give the British government some money to say that if they abscond and become a migrant labor population, you know, that doesn't have a job or position and they're just hanging around in Bahrain, which they thought could be dangerous. In fact, there were attempts, you know, where Baluchis tried to assassinate the British agent, you know, so, you know, the British have all kinds of political problems, you know, with groups that are trying to rebel, workers who are being up, who are upset. And so one way of controlling the labor population with when you're short staffed in manpower was to delegate this down to the employer. And they expanded this to the employer under the oil system. And so when these and, you know, many of these countries did not actually become independent until like Qatar, until the early 1970s. So you have this entire period from the late 19th century, you know, to um, you know, 1973 or four, that it's under British rule. They put in place all of these systems. The one thing that changes is that Qataris and Bahrainis move from being the lowest, okay, in terms of the labor hierarchy to suddenly being the citizens at the top of the labor hierarchy. And as a result, the citizen is then responsible you know, the Bahraini or the Qatari or the Dubai citizen is then responsible for, you know, the same system is just being administered now in a slightly different way. And so I think that's important, you know, as a history to understand how these labor regimes develop. This was very similar to indenture that the British developed for the same, you know, South Asian populations that they moved around all over their empire, whether it was East Africa or the Caribbean. Uh, you know, to replace slavery, right? What You know, the British are known for opposing slavery. Well, they got rid of slavery, but then introduced other forms of exploitative, you know, labor regimes that, you know, were just organized in a slightly different way. And so the other point that I want to make about it is because there's been a lot of just attention on the labor abuses, the migrant workers who built stadiums in 10 years, you know, in order to host the World Cup in Qatar, many deaths, many abuses. All of this is important to pay attention. But what's really important is to point out that this kind of labor regime is part of the global circulation of labor under modern capitalism. And let's point out that migrant labor in agricultural sectors in the U.S. uh, West or even here in Canada, where, you know, they have a separate kind of visa worker system where there is sponsorship by a particular employer that gives them incredible power and makes it impossible for laborers from Central America who come in under the system to organize for their rights or to demand higher wages. They don't get health care under the the system. There's all kinds of we have doctors here in America who are not allowed to they're brought in and they're not allowed to leave the hospital if they try That's to negotiate. Exactly correct. So, you know, the way in which the some of the criticism, although just is without any context and without any sense of the wider system of labor regimes, uh, I think is something that's worth pausing on and pointing out that it's just the most 
obvious crystallizing of the abuses within a global labor system that is frankly present all over the world. Right. Great. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Professor Marianne, let's uh, talk about Rachel Ventura and John Lash. All politics is local. Tell us. Yeah, what's going this, on was, with our- this is, uh, you know, a, a, it's just an example of what you can do when national politics becomes impossible. And quite frankly, the way that, you know, the the squad and the progressives have behaved has been a little went beyond disappointing um to union busting that so on the you get mad or frustrated or stuck there you go locally and then you find out just how wide open things can be rachel ran against uh, bill foster two years ago rachel ventura ventura and she was outspent of course what did she run for what did she run for she ran for a congress she ran in the 11th district here. And, uh, you know, when you're doing it with a mostly volunteer force and you don't have party backing and you don't have all the big money and you don't, you know, it was hard just to get her recognized. But she got 42 percent of the vote. And I was so happy uh, that she decided to go and run for state Senate because she said, you know, she understood what she was up against with the Democratic Party in the state of Illinois. But after redistricting, these state Senate districts were wide open. Nonetheless, the Democratic Party and their PAC spent almost a million dollars in the primary against her. It was quite spectacular. But, but, you know, you have a good ground game. You've got volunteers. Plus, you run as a slate. You've got there was a slate of progressives. One of them was a very young woman, 29 years old, that has replaced her on the Will County board coming in. So she uh, she defeated the uh, the her opponent in the Democratic Party handily by about 11 points. She then went on to defeat the Republican candidate. And of course, the Republican candidate picked a young black lady to run as their, you know, as their candidate. And uh, that uh, didn't work. So not only that, but she has been in contact because John Lash was her campaign manager and he knows how to make coalitions and he knows how that politics isn't about winning one election. It's about building coalitions. There are now going to be about 13 uh, hardcore progressives in the state Senate this uh, that are going to be sworn in next month. And that'll be great. And they there are they are coming in with some non-negotiable demands. So uh, even though the uh, the legendary Michael Madigan, who was sort of the strong man of the Democratic Party here, Speaker of the House for for decades, even though he is gone in a cloud of scandals, plural, nonetheless, his uh, his organization is still more or less intact. So it's good that you have a bunch of people who are willing to be disruptive, not disruptive of law or legislation, just a disruptive of the regular little power structures that do not benefit the citizens whatsoever. Right. Very happy. So. John Lash is uh, has been on the show. He, he ran for mayor of Aurora. Yes, he did. He also ran for he ran twice for Congress. He was the Democratic nominee with when the Democratic Party completely ignored it, running against Denny Hastert. At one point in his campaign, he was polling within single digits of Denny Hastert which caused a panic on the Republican side. Denny came up here, spent $5 million. Nonetheless, John got over 40% of the votes. So the Democratic Party rewarded him after having gone out and recruited half the precinct committee people in that district. They rewarded him by pushing a self-funding millionaire, my friend Bill Foster, um, to be the Democratic nominee. Um, John lost that election that primary election in 2008 by 379 votes. Mm. Though though, uh, Foster himself poured $2 million of his own money. Well, you know, I'm just so glad something like that would have me tied up in knots emotionally, but John has never stopped advocating. And he, 
He ran for school board, made some uh, what well, got elected, got some significant victories on the school board. He ran for mayor a couple of years ago and lost because the Democratic Party decided to back the two Republicans, <laughs> the respective Democratic parties of Kane and uh, and and DuPage County. So um, nonetheless, um, John has scored some victories. He has organized moves by the city council that was going to be like just blatantly against the interests of the of the citizens and to basically reward campaign donors. Um, we had a recent loss, mostly because it was done surreptitiously, but uh, the whole city council unanimously voted to uh, issue a bond, to have a bond issue for $50 million, in other words, taxpayers dollars to help the casino finance a move from downtown Aurora to right off the expressway. Oh, that's good. That's good. A several billion dollar, because, you know, a year business needs that money. Also, to add insult to injury, they're in a TIF area, which is basically a tax something. It's it's like a ta tax, uh, property tax deferred area. This was set up uh, initially to get businesses to go in very uh, economically stressed areas. That made a certain amount of sense. The uh, the property right off the interstate is not distressed area. It is right across the street from a, this incredibly successful outlet mall. And the casinos uh, are a dying industry in the state of Illinois. A casino won't be able to survive unless they also have like convention facilities and everything else. So the fact that it was a unanimous vote on the city council, and I think everybody on the city council were just afraid that if they voted against it, then all the political forces would see to it that they would lose their jobs. You need one person, one person on that city council standing up, making speeches, getting the local newspapers and maybe the Chicago Tribune to write them up and get some you know, publicity could have halted this. So John is running and we are we're going to that's going to be something positive locally for us to be doing this spring because the consolidated uh, elections for city <clears throat> elections are going to be first week in April. Anyway, right. that's how you can, you know, you don't need a big majority. You can, you know, um, maybe once you get to Congress, you know, you get there with a bunch of people and oh, if you're. Your position as congressperson is too precious. We have to get you reelected. So you're basically straitjacketed from doing the kind of bold action. Well, you can do it on the local level and it can really matter more. I like to brag that I'm more responsible for people getting minimum wage around here than Ocasio-Cortez was. Fantastic. So, you know, that's uh, act locally. Yeah. Think globally and locally because the local can be global. And I'm just, you know, by the way, nice little bit of news this week. The the uh, University of California system has settled. Thank you. The union. Is it the UAW? No, it's the I don't know what you know, there are major. I think there was a big union that kind of partnered with them. But this was the union of, you know, basically that was uh, graduate students, non tenured professors. You know, it's basically your non tenured university staff. Right. that keep the universities going. And I, I had a great time because earlier this week I was with, I had lunch with some colleagues who were from that system and they're kind of bitching about it. And I'm just sitting there laughing, pointing and laughing across the table. <laughs> oh, sad day for you. Such a sad mm -hmm. story. Anyway, right. um, you know, that's, there is nothing more exploitative than our university system. You know, considering the enormous amounts of funds that go through universities and the enormous amount of overheads that universities take from my grants, from everybody else's grant. For what? Uh, who are they? The administrators. Yeah. It's all about the administrators. Let's end on an upbeat, happy note. George Santos, Congressman elect George Santos. Mm -hmm. Who is he? What does he claim to be? Is, is he I don't gonna... know. I just heard that, you know, uh, Congressman rep misrepresents himself. And I'm going. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> and the sun comes up every morning, you know, like I, I didn't, I, I confess I didn't pay attention to it, but you know, I'm thinking that, well, Obama wasn't who he said he was. And, you know, a lot of people who <laughs> aren't who they say they were. So. Well, th- 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 this is much more extreme. He's 34 years old and all the else in his life seemed to be not quite true. He claimed that he was gay. Uh, he divorced a wife, uh, a cisgender wife uh, in 2019. He claims he currently has a husband, but there's no record of it. But he's using that to oppose the the revelation that he might not even be gay, which is also interesting, and that he that he essentially became a gay candidate because he was running against uh, a fellow the name of Zimmerman in the election, who is who is gay, and it's just it he has this incredibly weird history where he claimed that he was Jewish on his mother's side, but there's no proof of that. Uh, he he claimed that it that he had. Uh, relatives in the Holocaust. Um, uh, he, uh, uh, he's, he's gotten into, he's uh, done check kiting in Brazil. Uh, he, and he's running in the weirdest district. I mean, he's running in the weirdest district. This is Peter King's old district, right? Do you oh, remember yeah. Peter King as oh, being, yeah. you know, in favor of the Contras and a bunch of other things, although we discovered that he was sending money to the IRA. So, you know, it always is quite hey, weird. Well, you know, what the hell is was he Irish? <laughs> hey, so you're you know? telling me that he's almost as outrageous as Joe Biden was when Joe Biden said he marched with Martin Luther King, said he earned three degrees, was at the top of his class when he's running for president. Well, but, you yeah. know, I mean, at least we know even even if Joe Biden was at the bottom of his law school class at Syracuse. We don't even know whether Santos finished any college. He claimed he had an MBA <laughs> from NYU. He claimed he had a bachelor's degree from Baruch. And so the New York <laughs> Times has done this massive, massive investigation and they checked every damn thing. And almost everything he said was a lie. Everything. I mean, it was like it was so weird. You only expect one or two little kind of things that you can <laughs> weasel around this dude. I, well, I, I want to to set up a petition because I think and uh, speaking of uh, Republicans being in favor of Russia, uh, he should get the Rex Tillerson uh, medal that uh, the Russian Federation order of friendship, because this guy, there's so much disinformation. I don't know what he is. I mean, the T-Rex award. He's a politician. <laughs> well, yeah, he, his, see, his latest tweet, he made a tweet a couple hours ago to the people of NY03. I have my story to tell and it will be told next week. Not and another one the week after. after. <laughs> <laughs> I want to assure everyone that I will address your questions and that I remain committed to deliver the results I came, uh, campaigned on. Public safety, inflation, education and more. Happy holidays to you all. How does that happen? I know the Republicans are literally the gang that can shoot straight, that they they truly are ignorami. Is there no vetting at all of their candidates? Well, the Dem- the Democrats didn't even do a good op- oppo job. I don't know what the nobody seized on any of his you know weirdness, and uh, I mean that that his uh, there was no. He couldn't explain how he, he had uh, gotten a huge amount of donations to his campaign. But I, I think that just comes from being in that district. And there's all these other things that it, that are that are just weird. You know, he he um, he's been a delinquent renter up to the tune of thousands and thousands of dollars uh, at, at several different things. And then he has a whole bunch of landlord sort of related issues. It, it's all quite weird. There, uh, there's very little that seems you know, actual. And do you are you rooting for even though he's a Republican? Is there a part of you who's got like a catch me if you can? Affinity exactly. Guy? That's exactly who he is. But and and the, it's creating a big embarrassment because he's a Trumpist. He's a denier. He's he's uh, 
Uh, he's said all kinds of strange things. He's pro McCarthy. So that's that's a whole nother set of issues about Joe whether he's gonna, or Kevin. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> and whether he's going to get any committee assignments or any, it's this is all quite weird. So the uh, I, the New York Times is really seized on this. And I think local New York press is going to going to run him through the ringer on on all of these matters. Uh, it's just so weird that, oh, he won't name his husband. So. The husband is a pharmacist, but now we're going to get this whole investigation of, well, is he really married to this guy or, you know, uh, it's just quite amusing. Anyway. You, know, you know, I I live in New York. He's in Long Island, Peter King's old district mm -hmm. there. He could be he could become a folk hero. <laughs> New York. He could become beloved, like he could be the quintessential New Yorker, you come to New York to reinvent yourself. So there, there's something. Uh, but the Lord of Levittown, whatever. Yes. <laughs> OK, fantastic. I missed all of you. This is my head is spinning and uh, you make me want to read. Uh, thank, thank you. You make me want to read. Joe, uh, we'll wrap it up in a second, but let's go to Joe in Norway. How is your walk? You're walking hard on your walk. Joe? Uh, we, you have to unmute yourself. He's panicking. <laughs> too, too much going on. Hold on a minute. <laughs> All right. okay. So I have to say... I was kind of disappointed that you were going to be seasoning your walk, but it turned out yes. to be riveting. It's not as riveting as you're preparing a meal, but it was aesthetically pleasing. We should mention Rahima.org, by the way. Everybody this holiday season should give to Rahima.org, R-A-H-I-M-A dot O-R-G. Earlier, Professor Bick was talking about how we're still not going to provide for refugees from Afghanistan, Rahima.org does. They provide a food pantry for refugees in the San Francisco Bay Area, and it's healthy, good food. So give to Rahima.org. Joe and yeah. Noel. Thanks. So, Thanks so, for that so, uh, message. Well, and basically, it's before I can do any cooking, before I can do any cooking, I need to season it. So we've got a nice patina now. So it's essentially a nonstick surface. And then with every cooking, it'll get more, uh, the fats will create the polymers and then build up a nice patina. So anytime I, I um, need to do this, I just uh, fire up the wok and then we get the nice uh, nonstick for some, some months. Great. And for Americans who are watching, uh, that white stuff is called snow, something you might be uh, unfamiliar with. It's called snow. Uh, thank you, Joe in Norway. We'll see you at office hours. Yes, thank you. Professor Marianne, you're in Michigan. Or have you been hit by this apocalypse? It's just beginning to sleet. I can hear it, but it's still like above freezing. However, last I checked, like about two hours ago, it was zero in Aurora. And wow. it's going to get down to minus eight tonight. Okay. And it's going to be sleeting, even that cold. That's and going to be Professor Bick, Lee and Hussein, are you getting snowpocalypsed? Not yet. Well, we have uh, we're going to have uh, fifty-five degrees tomorrow, David. Lots of rain, and then. A uh, very strong wind and then going down to 10 degrees at night. Hmm. So, huge temperature sh shift. Right. And in Canada, Professor? Well, it has started uh, snowing and sleeting. It's starting to warm up. So we're going to get uh, rain. Um, I don't think it's going to be very good driving weather for me tomorrow. Um, so where are you driving to? Uh, driving down to Connecticut for the holidays. Oh, oh my uh, God. Sort of right through this whole storm. So I don't know how that's going to go, but. Is that a good uh, idea? 
Probably not. Maybe it, it may be more advisable to go on Saturday. Um, I make with, a recommendation about. Yeah, if you have any any recommendations, fight with your family throughout the entire. Oh, that's a given. <laughs> that's a given. <laughs> You're saying it helps you concentrate on the road, right? You know, or, or if you get into an accident, you don't feel so. I'm, that's <laughs> terrible. That's terrible to say. Uh, well, maybe I'll see you next week. Uh, yeah, in New York. I would love that. And uh, thank you, Professor Adnan Hussein. Your class on the Crusades is amazing. We're not going to have one this Saturday. When does it resume? It resumes Saturday, January 7th. Fantastic. And we'll at, plug that. at the usual time, 930 a.m. Uh, Eastern. Yeah, everyone's it, welcome. It just it, it, it to, to lie in bed, drink coffee and hear you talk about the Crusades. Uh, it's just uh, fantastic. Professor Ann Lee, thank you so much. Read her over at the Daily Cause or Coes, the Daily Coes, right? Coes, yes. And your your handle is Annie Lee and brilliant writer, P- Professor Mary Ann Cummings. Follow her on Twitter at Razor Girl. And uh, we'll be following your political career. Uh, when do you run for uh, president? When are... <laughs> president of which country? I don't know, but I need some parking tickets. Uh, we have to talk about Peru next week, by the way. Uh, that is uh, been missing from this show. And Professor Jonathan Bick, I'll see you tomorrow night at office hours when you teach the Twilight Zone. And then Saturday, you'll be teaching the uh, the Star Trek. And if my Christmas is canceled, maybe we'll uh, if, if, it, if it looks really bad, Joe in Norway, maybe we'll open up office hours for Christmas. If the weather is that bad, maybe we could do a special Christmas uh, and office hours. Dan, what do you think? Well, we'll have a meet. We'll have a quick meeting after this. Thank you all. Office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. I'm there for the first hour and then the community takes over. If you enjoyed this, please hit the like button, subscribe and share it with your friends. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak.